This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Get free access to Nebula, our new streaming service, when you sign up using the link below. For years, scientists and climate activists have warned us of the unsustainable amount of pollution produced by the world's cars, and rightly so. The world's passenger vehicles do contribute greatly to climate change. But as dangerous as the emissions from cars are, there exists a far greater threat that doesn't get nearly as much attention. Right now, chugging across the ocean somewhere, the world's largest cruise ships are producing millions of times the pollution of your average car. Taken together, these handful of floating luxury resorts are doing more to destroy our climate than all of the world's cars combined. In this episode, we're going to compare the emissions of land vehicles and cruise ships, and put in perspective just how unbelievably toxic the cruise industry is. Let's start by looking at some numbers. According to the EPA, the average car emits about 4.6 metric tons of CO2 per year. That's assuming a fuel economy of 22 miles per gallon and a total of 11,500 miles driven per year. Realistically, most cars these days get considerably better gas mileage than 22 mpg, so this average car is actually a bit dirtier than we'd see in real life. If we take that emissions number and multiply it by the number of cars on the road today, estimated to be around 1 billion, we get a total worldwide output of 4 billion 600 million metric tons of CO2 per year. That's a lot of pollution. Those numbers will eventually come down as electric cars become more widely available and the process of making them becomes cleaner. But as of right now, passenger vehicles are a major source of concern. The average cruise ship can produce as much as 1 million times the emissions of the average car every day. But CO2 is only part of the picture. It's definitely the pollutant that gets the most attention, and it is a potent warming agent, but there are other substances that are so damaging to the environment and human life that they're rarely even allowed to be used in land vehicles. One such material is heavy fuel, a residual product that's left over after gasoline and diesel have been produced. Heavy fuel has a very high sulfur content, but is more cost-effective than other fuels, which, unsurprisingly, has led to its use in giant, fuel-hungry shipping engines. Royal Caribbean's vessel, the Harmony, for example, houses two four-story tall 16-cylinder engines, which each burn almost 1,400 gallons of fuel per hour, or about 66,000 gallons per day. Not of regular gasoline or diesel, but of some of the foulest, most damaging fuel in existence. To give you an idea of just how bad the pollution from these engines is, consider their requirements when docked. When sitting in port, cruise liners have to switch to low sulfur fuel or use so-called abatement technologies, basically a fancy term for trying to stop some of the worst pollutants from escaping the ship. But these measures still aren't enough. Citizens of Southampton have formed an environmental group in response to the massive vessels that dock along their coast, as they've seen their environment become more and more toxic each year. The locals say the wind blows the pollution over the entire city, which has led to an alarming increase in respiratory diseases and cancer. As far as they can tell, the cruise companies do not monitor the emissions and their effect on the area. The activist group, Southampton Clean Air, has pushed for the liners to switch to shore power, but the companies have resisted. Experts from Germany and Brussels have analyzed such vessels, and determined that a single cruise liner and harbor would have to burn at least 150 tons of fuel per day, and they would emit more sulfur than several million cars and more particulate emissions than thousands of London buses. Southampton is Britain's busiest cruise liner terminal, and can have as many as five of these monstrous ships in harbor at one time. Because of this, Southampton is one of nine UK cities cited by the World Health Organization as breaching air quality guidelines, despite having very little manufacturing. The pollution comes from the massive ships along their coast. To make matters worse, efforts to curb the environmental and human impact of these vessels have largely failed. When in international waters, there's nothing stopping the cruise liners from dumping hundreds of thousands of gallons of sewage directly into the ocean, along with the toxic byproducts of what are referred to as emissions cheat systems. These systems are designed to wash and scrub pollutants from cheap fuel, and this hazardous waste is then dumped into the ocean to avoid disposal fees. These practices, plus the staggering output of sulfur and nitrogen oxide, contribute greatly to the destruction of marine ecosystems. It suffocates marine animals, bleaches coral reefs, and when the sulfur mixes with water and air, it forms sulfuric acid and rains down not only on the ocean, but also on cities and forests, contributing to health problems and deforestation. Several global organizations have called for stricter standards to be applied to the cruise industry, or to have them come into compliance with agreements such as the Paris Accord. But so far, the industry has proven resilient against such measures. Until places like the United States have effective public transit systems, cars will be necessary to keep the country running. And maybe that's what makes cruise ships so appalling. The whole industry is wildly unnecessary. It's a monument to decadence and gluttony in the face of tremendous damage to the climate, endangered ecosystems, and human health. 
As the quest for cleaner, renewable energy continues, cruise ships should be near the top of the list for a major overhaul. If you'd like to learn more about fossil fuels and possible alternatives, I highly recommend you check out Energy of the Future on CuriosityStream. It tackles the problems we're facing with pollution from fossil fuels and the fact that we're running out of them anyway. Plus, it's narrated by Sigourney Weaver, which is always cool. If you watch my videos, you'll know that I'm a big fan of CuriosityStream. It's an online streaming service with thousands of nonfiction titles from some of the best filmmakers in the game. I've recently partnered with CuriosityStream to build my new car show, Grand Test Auto, that I host with Joseph from Real Life Lore. Grand Test Auto is available right now on Nebula, a streaming video platform built by and for independent creators like CGP Grey, Polyphonic, Real Engineering, Wendover Productions, and of course, Second Thought and Real Life Lore, among others. Because we all appreciate how supportive our fans are, CuriosityStream is offering a free Nebula subscription with every purchase of a year-long CuriosityStream membership. With this bundle, you get the best of both worlds. CuriosityStream is home to high production value documentaries and nonfiction work, whereas Nebula is a place for educational YouTubers to try new things and experiment with different formats, things the YouTube algorithm would punish us for. CuriosityStream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so they're offering Second Thought fans free access to Nebula when you sign up at curiositystream.com slash second thought. When you sign up for CuriosityStream, you get instant access to thousands of nonfiction titles like Energy of the Future, and you'll get to watch a whole bunch of new episodes from Grand Test Auto, as well as other great Nebula originals like Working Titles, a series dedicated to breaking down popular TV show intros, and the first episode of Real Engineering's new series on the logistics of World War II. By signing up for CuriosityStream, you'll be helping not just me, but the entire educational community, as we work together to build a place where we can create exciting new content that just wouldn't be possible on YouTube. Give it a try by signing up using the link below. I promise you'll love it.